Ah, oh, oh. Okay, that's, that's me, there we go. I want to start, <laughs> I'm going to start today with a magic trick. <laughs> okay, what, what is this? Water. Water, yeah, that's right, it's water. I'm going to transform this before your very eyes. Okay, um, what is this now? It's, it's still water. <laughs> All right, now that all the now that all the cool people are still here, <laughs> let's get let's get started. Uh, hello, uh, I'm really excited to be here in Amsterdam. There's so many red lights here; it's pretty exciting. Uh, <laughs> my name's Aaron Patterson. I am a code comedian. I hope uh, I am your final keynoter today at at uh, Rails World. Um, <laughs> I am delivering the final keynote, and any time I speak at a conference, like, I, I, I'm always nervous until like, I get to give my talk, and when my talk is over, I feel, I feel relieved. So I'm excited that I'll finally be able to get this talk over with and be able to enjoy the rest of Rails World. <laughs> it was great to see, it was great to see um, David speak this time, and, you know, it's, <laughs> it's okay that I'm speaking last because, like, I get to think about what David said in his presentation and then respond to it in my presentation. And I think that since, since, since David is our, is our strict Rails daddy, uh, I, really, <laughs> I really hope that I can be the, the fun Rails uncle <laughs> of, the, of the conference. Uh, so David announced a bunch of really great stuff in his, in his keynote, including solid cache. That was really cool. Solid queue. But I'd like, I'd like to make my own pre, like, announce my own things today, including uh, solid snake. Uh, also, also solid, solid as a rock. Really, really exciting stuff today to announce. Now, David's talk was great, really great. But honestly, I don't, like, I don't think he had enough jokes in his presentation. Um, I feel it was a bit uh, uh, dry RB. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, hello, my name is Aaron Patterson. You may know me from the internet as Tenderlove. You can find some social media stuff there. Uh, you probably know me know me best from posting on the um, the Rails discourse uh, uh, message board. You might know me from such. From such great articles as CVE 20233037, CVE 20224457, and my personal favorite, CVE 20232836, a true classic, that one. Uh, also, this, today, this year, in cooperation with Justin Searles, we released a brand new test framework called TLDR, and TLDR actually stands for Too Long Didn't Run. This test framework, if you use this test framework, what it does, the special thing about this test framework, is that if your tests take longer than 1.8 seconds, it just kills the process. So if you use this, if you use this test framework, and if your tests take longer than 1.8 seconds, now they don't. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an example. Like here we have, this is, this is what a test, test looks like with TLDR. A uh, demo case where we have a failure and a failure and a non-failure plus one that's just too slow. If we run it, I'm going to run it here. Uh, you'll see that it sits there, and then all of a sudden it just dies after 1.1.8 seconds. So why did we feel like you can see the nice output? There's very nice output here. Actually, I thought this was all a joke until I tried running it, and I was like, wow, the output's really nice. Actually, maybe maybe I should use this. Uh, <laughs> So why did we feel that we needed to rewrite test frameworks? Why, why did we feel this way? Well, do you, does anyone know what this number is? Yeah? This is the federal funds market rate. <laughs> this is a graph of the federal funds market rate. And if you map the releases of RSpec and Minitest, <laughs> federal funds market rate, These test, work were, these test frameworks were a zero interest rate phenomenon. We, we can't afford to wait more than 1.8 seconds. So, 
<laughs> no, the TLDR is just use, use TLDR. Uh, so anyway, I work for, I work for a mom and pop e-commerce website called Shopify. Um, uh, this is this is in fact a technical presentation. I'm going to be giving you a technical presentation. Now, um, I, I'm actually very nervous and afraid that people might think that this presentation is boring. But actually, I was reading an article that said like uh, people who are bored like. It, boredom increases their creativity. So I figured like either you'll learn something from this talk or your creativity will be increased. So, so either way, it's a win-win, right? Now, I, I love Ruby. I love Ruby. I've been a Ruby developer for a very long time. I love Ruby and I love Rails. I especially love Rails. I love Ruby because Ruby lets me code creatively. Like this, this code actually works. You can run, go ahead and run this code today. It works. I think it's really fun. And uh, it also lets me code efficiently. Like here's an example of some Java code that I, I actually had to write back in the day. Uh, I can go ahead and rewrite that in Ruby like this. It's so, so efficient. I can get my job done in a tenth of lines. Uh, and I love Rails because it's built with Ruby, so I get all those nice features from Ruby and for free inside of the framework. But what's really exciting about Rails is that Rails goes even further than Ruby. Uh, Rails is a great framework, uh, framework for building really great web applications. And one thing I love about Rails is that it takes many decisions away from us. Like, we don't have to decide certain things, like test frameworks, for example. Well, you should use TLDR, but we, <laughs> we decided what test framework you should use. You don't have to think about that when you start a Rails application. You don't have to think about what ORM you should use. Uh, you don't have to think about what folders you should put things in. And this, these were actually things that developers had to think about back in the day. Like, take time out of your day to think about. And there, it's just stuff that we don't care. It doesn't matter. Developing our application is what matters. Now, Rails is, I said Rails is a great framework for building uh, web applications. And uh, this, I think this is in kind of contrast to Ruby. Ruby is a general purpose programming language, meaning that we can use Ruby in any particular context that we want to. So we can use Ruby for building any type of tools that we want to versus Rails, which has a specific purpose, which is to make the, the, best, uh, the best place for you to develop a web application. Uh, this is why Rails modifies the Ruby programming language with functions to make web application development much easier. And what I'm talking about here are monkey patches. Specifically, I'm talking about monkey patches. And why Rails monkey patches Ruby? Unfortunately, it's very, very common for web browsers to send our web applications like a bunch of hot garbage, and we have to deal with that stuff in our applications. And this is why Rails does this stuff. Like, for example, the dot blank method. This is a method that's not available in, in Ruby, but it is available in Rails. And I think this is really nice because we have to deal with this type of stuff as web application developers. Now, that's not to say I'm a huge fan of these all the time. For example, like, I, I don't understand why true class and false class respond to blank. Like, I don't, I don't understand why, why Booleans are blank. For example, if you have some code here and you call dot blank on it, you probably ought to know whether it's a string or a Boolean. Anyway, that's not, neither here nor there. Uh, the point is, that I'm trying to say is that both Ruby and Rails are extremely optimized. They're very, very optimized, but they're optimized for productivity. So Ruby is a language that's optimized for general purpose programming languages or programs, and Rails is optimized for writing web applications incredibly quickly. Uh, so we can build, we're optimized for building apps fast, but unfortunately, that leaves us with kind of like a double-edged ruler. I uh, didn't have a sword thing, so I used a ruler here. <laughs> Where our productivity might be extremely high, but maybe our app performance isn't necessarily as good as we would like it. And the truth is that we can actually have both of these. We can have high productivity and high app performance, but it requires a few tricks on, on our part as developers. Uh, I think this presentation has 235 slides, and I calculated that's like 15 seconds per slide, so I'm going to move here. We're going to talk about three things, performance from the big picture, uh, writing fast apps, and writing apps fast. But first, let's talk about performance big picture, and I actually want to rant here a little bit. Uh, usually, I'm a pretty positive person, or otherwise known as PPP. 
<laughs> but I've been seeing a trend lately that's got me positively peeved and I want to address it. Uh, this, is, this is like, I, I'm, now I'm being a meta programmer with, with meta frustrations here. Uh, I, I was thinking about these problems and how to describe them best. And I kept thinking to myself, there's many layers to these problems inside of me, like, like a kind of onion that's aggravated. So I put um, aggravated, aggravated onion into mid-journey, and this is, this is what I got. <laughs> so I kind of want to start at the center of my annoyance onion and move, move out a little bit. The first thing is that uh, I think it's been pretty common knowledge in the, in the Ruby community that like, if some code is too slow, we should just rewrite that code and see. Now, I'm not particularly pleased with this idea, but that's just the, the way it was. However, the thing is, though, C is a programming language. Well, C sucks. It's not a fun programming language. If you, use, if you program in C, it's hard to write. Um, it crashes. You have to manually ma manage memory. The syntax is annoying. And you need to understand how Ruby internals works. So, once you know, like, oh, man, I need to know all of these things, I feel a lot of developers are like, well, maybe let's just not do this. So C extensions, just from the fact that C is such a bad language, help prevent people from actually writing C extensions. Now, unfortunately, I shouldn't say that. I'm just being a little bit too mean. Uh, <laughs> there is a new language around called Rust. And Rust is supposed to help us write lower level code more safely. So if you read through the documentation, this language says, hey, it gets rid of all these foot guns that, that C provides us with. Like, we can get rid of those. We don't have to worry about memory management. We don't have to worry about crashes, all that, all that stuff. So it's sold on this idea that Rust is memory safe. So what I'm afraid is that people are thinking to themselves, well, if it's too slow, instead of writing it in C, I'll rewrite it in Rust. And this actually bothers me a lot. I'm going to show you, show you something. There, there's a framework called Magnus. Magnus is Ruby bindings for Rust. It's like if you want to write uh, Rust extensions for Ruby, you use this thing. Now, we're going to go take a look at the readme for this project. If we scroll all the way down, 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 uh, down. Wait, I missed it. And up a little bit, it says safety. There is a section on safety. And I want to highlight this two paragraphs from this, this section on safety. When using Magnus in Rust code, Ruby objects must be kept on the stack. If objects are moved to the heap, the Ruby GC cannot reach them, and they may be garbage collected. This could lead to memory safety issues. It is not possible to enforce this rule in Rust type system or via the borrow checker. Users of Magnus must maintain this rule uh, manually. Now, how many of you, you in here understand every word in this paragraph? Few of you, yes, OK. Now, what this means is that Rust cannot guarantee memory safety when it's working with Ruby objects. It just can't. So this is one layer of my frustration, is that you're getting this, you're, you're getting this uh, thing said to you, like, hey, you can write in Rust, it'll be safe. But that's not actually true when you're dealing with Ruby objects. And this is the one layer of my frustration. So. <laughs> If you are uncomfortable writing an extension in C and you think you would be safe writing an extension in Rust, then I have bad news for you. My, now, my professional advice is if you want to write C extensions or Rust extensions, uh, don't. Just don't do that. <laughs> what I would actually recommend to you is to use, use YJIT. Please, seriously, use YJIT. If you use YJIT, like, Rails bench with YJIT is 67% faster. Now, of course, this is like not real world, not a real world test. But here we have a tweet from Toby. We're seeing 10% speed improvements on, uh, uh, where are we seeing this? I forgot what app this was. But we're seeing 10% speed improvements. And this is an older tweet. Uh, we're seeing speed improvements on discourse. Even a couple, like I think last week, here's a tweet from DHH. They deployed it to Basecamp, I guess, and they're seeing uh, performance improvements there as well. So seriously, just try with YJIT first. Now, I think a lot of people will say, but Rust is so fast. It's so much faster. And I, that's true. It's true. So here's, here is an algorithm. We're sorting a list in Ruby. OK? It's, I have this algorithm. It's too slow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this, this algorithm in Rust. And this next layer of my aggravation onion is that I don't like these types of language to language comparisons because it feels like we're comparing apples with beagles here. Rust is missing a lot of the language features that we use every day in Ruby. 
for example, like monkey patching that we're using in Rails. Now, I know that these features aren't free. However, we can eliminate the overhead using a JIT. So Rust doesn't have to worry about that. We do, but using a JIT compiler, we can actually optimize those things out. So that said, YJIT is helping us close that performance gap, and we've been able to demonstrate that uh, using pure Ruby, we can actually exceed the performance of a C extension when paired with YJIT, and you can check out the blog post there. So, so far, I've been fairly low level, like pretty in the weeds with my, my little onion here. <laughs> um, I want to go back to the code example. This sorting algorithm, does anybody recognize this? This sorting algorithm is actually bubble sort, and it's on squared. That's the performance, the uh, time performance of this thing. In, order, in other words, the time it takes to sort a list is the number of elements in that list squared. So in fact, this algorithm is really terrible. And I'll grant, like, granted, if you take this algorithm and port it to Rust, it'll absolutely be faster in Rust. Absolutely. But why didn't we just pick a better algorithm? Now, the example, this example is very small. Yeah, of course, it's a bad algorithm. We shouldn't use that. But I want to use it as part of like a bigger thought. And that bigger thought is that performance should be a holistic endeavor. We should look at the entire performance of our system when we're, when we're thinking about performance. Just a very tiny example. Let's say you have a response time of around 300 milliseconds, and maybe we only spend 1% of our time doing that, that silly bubble sort. Even if we could, like completely eliminated the bubble sort, now we're down to like 297 milliseconds. I guarantee none of your users are going to notice this. Zero people will notice that you shaved off those three milliseconds. So I think a better question to ask is, what is fast enough? Like, how fast do we need to be? So we should reframe this. Maybe 300 milliseconds is fine. Maybe that's a perfectly reasonable response time for what we're doing. And instead of focusing on performance, we should be building new features so we can make more money. Uh, but there is, a, there is a point at which doing this performance doesn't pay, doing performance work doesn't pay, and instead we should be focusing on something more beneficial. So I think answering this question uh, will help us drive techniques that we need to use in order to speed up our apps. For example, maybe we want to use like more servers, or maybe we want to add caching, maybe we want to add content preloading, maybe we want to buy new NVMEs. <laughs> Additionally, speed isn't always about time. Speed is also about uh, setting expectations. So I want to give a couple examples of setting expectations. And these two examples are actually on, on us. Uh, when I say us, I mean the Ruby core team and the Rails core team. This is a really great, really great example. I, I love this bug right here. Uh, this is a ticket that was filed in the Ruby bug tracker a couple of weeks ago. And what this bug tracker said, what this bug says is, when I run this first chunk of code, it is way faster than if I run the bottom chunk of code. And it turns out that this is actually a bug. It shouldn't be that way. They should be about the same, the same speed. The expectation was that these two chunks were the same, or they, at least they should be equivalent, but they weren't. And this is a bug, and we fixed it. Another example here is this is, this is actually the same thing. This is Eileen's first pull request, I think. Exactly the same problem that she encountered. She had a performance expectation about one of the APIs in Active Record, and it didn't meet her expectations. And she, she gave a presentation about how you should use this one API instead of another, but it turns out they should be basically the same. <laughs> so that's what we paired on, and that's how we came up with this pull request. This type of performance expectation mismatch is exactly how Eileen got started working on Rails internals. So my point here is that I think a holistic approach to performance yields better results overall, and it's pretty rare that this holistic, holistic approach means rewrite your code base in Rust. And I think that this is a hard pill for some developers to swallow. Like, by doing direct ports, we're not actually innovating. We're just kicking the can down the road a little bit. Doing a direct port from one language to another doesn't have any innovation behind it. And it's something that, like, ChatGPT could do. So if it's something that ChatGPT could do, why, why are we bothering with it? In fact, those, uh, the secret is that those examples I gave were generated by ChatGPT. <laughs> So that is, I feel like I've spent enough time being annoyed on stage, which I'm usually not. I'm going to end this, burn up our, burn up our uh, aggravation onion. I'm going to return back to being the Rails fun uncle now. I can't, like, I feel really bad. I can't get up on stage and be like, you should never use Rust. You should never do this stuff without 
telling you like, okay, well, you know, how do I figure out what's slow in my app? Like, what, where am I spending my time? So I want to talk about, I want to move on to talking about writing fast applications. So instead of saying like, hey, don't rewrite your code, I'm going to tell you here is how to speed it up. So let's try to figure out what is slow in our application. We're going to talk about writing fast apps, and I want to talk about profiling. So I'm going to cover how profilers work. Uh, I'm also going to discuss how to read profiler output, and I'm hoping that this will arm you with the information that you need in order to get your Rails applications up to the speed, like the performance expectations that you want. Uh, we're going to look at a new tool that I've been working on with um, John Hawthorne. Well, John Hawthorne started it. It's called Vernier. Uh, this is a profiler that we've been working on together. It is a, what we call a next generation C Ruby profiler. The things that we wanted out of this profiler were we wanted great UI. We wanted something that was easy to read, easy to understand. We wanted better insights into the behavior of our applications. We want multi-thread support. Uh, many of you probably use Puma. How many use Puma in here? A lot of people? Oh, nice. OK. And you'll notice that Puma is multi-threaded. So having something with multi-thread support is important. Uh, and we wanted to write a sampling profiler. So Vernier is a sampling profiler. And profiling tools are one of my very favorite tools for exploring a very large code base. Uh, not only do you get a sense of like what is slow in the code base, but you can get an understanding of how the application works as well. Uh, a sampling profiler is just a profiler that takes a stack trace of your program at, so, at regular intervals and then reports them to you. So for example, let's say we have this very slow code here, just sleeps for a while. What we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we're, we're the computers here right now and we're going to graph this thing out over time. We're going to graph the stack traces over time. So let's say we, we have this code. We start at the bottom here. It sleeps for two seconds, and we get a stack trace there. And we see we're at the main, the main frame for the, uh, the first two seconds. We call call slow. In call slow, we sleep for one second. Then we call slow function. It sleeps for two seconds. There for two seconds. That returns. We sleep for seven more seconds. And then finally, we return from this and sleep for one second. So, um, maybe we could like somehow modify our code to record every function entry and exit and time that, but that's way too expensive for our programs to actually do. Uh, it puts too much burden on the running application. So instead what we do is we have a program that sits there and samples the call frames every so often. So instead of just recording our entries and exits, what we'll do is as time is going along, we'll just take samples. So here in this example, every 500 milliseconds, we're taking a sample. So if we do that, and then we count up how many samples the top frame has, so in this case, main frame had six samples, call slow had 17, and slow function had three. In this case, we're able to understand where we're spending our time. So we know like call slow is the winner here. It's the slow one. We have 17 samples there, so we know that's our slow function. It's kind of important to know that samples doesn't necessarily equal time. The number of samples that we get does not equal, precisely equal the, the amount of time we're spending in a particular function. It's more of like a probability, so kind of like a, I don't know, vibes-based profiling, if you will. Um, so let's take a look at these samples again. Some of you probably noticed that the samples on the leading and trailing edges, we have samples there on the leading and trailing edges. So like, how do we blame those? Who gets that? Like, who gets that blame? This is why those samples don't necessarily precisely equal time. Now, you don't need to worry about this too much when you're profiling because, like, the percentages are overall correct. So, in other words, picking good intervals actually matters. However, most profilers pick these intervals for you, so you don't really need to worry about it. Uh, or you can, like, if it seems wrong, you can increase the interval, or if it's too much burden on your application, you can decrease the interval. So back to our program, if we take each of these samples and we draw a stack trace at each of these samples, it would look something like this, which is pretty close to our actual graph, but this is what our profilers see. Now, if we get rid of these lines and we make the stack trace wider, we'll end up with something like this, and this is our flame graph. This is a flame graph. It's not exactly the same as our original execution, but it's very, very close, and it gives us a visual representation of what the program is doing. Holy shit, 35 minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, we know that we're spending way too much time in calls slow because of this wide area there at the top. You can see visually, like, hey, that thing is too slow right there. And that's the thing that we need to look at. So I want to look at some profiler implementation. Uh, like, how do we actually implement a profiler? Let's do a very, very simple one right here. This is it, whole thing. 
Here is the sampling profiler. We start up a thread, we print out the backtrace every 500 milliseconds, and now we have an extremely simple sampling profiler. And we can look at the output here. This is the output from that program. And if we actually rotate it 90 degrees, we, <laughs> we can see here, this is, this is almost, <laughs> thank you, yes. This is almost identical to the sampling profiler, uh, the profile that we got out. Now I wanna do one, I wanna show one other thing. I wanna talk about call trees. So if we take these, if we take these samples and we, we add them up, we figure out who calls who and we add up the samples together, we'll have kind of a call tree. And I'll show you an example here. So our call tree shows, uh, call tree graph shows the total number of samples plus all the samples in its children. So you see here on the right, main has a total of 26. Main is six plus 17 plus three. You can see here, this is, this is what our tree looks like. Main calls, calls slow, calls slow, calls slow function. So I wanna sh just kind of point this out because we're gonna look at this in a real profile. Now caveats here, uh, the x-axis is always time spent. So along the x-axis, that is time. The y-axis is always uh, our stack. But the problem is the x-axis isn't always in order, okay? It's time spent, but it's not necessarily in order. Sometimes profilers will try to group things together to give you a better sense of where your time is being spent. It's not necessarily like, you know, t plus one plus two, et cetera. Uh, sometimes the stacks will grow down instead of up, so the x-axis will be on top, so it'll look something like that, too. But they're all the same thing. Just like, don't worry about it. As you're looking at the profiler, like just familiarize yourself with the graph and you'll get it. So the recap is, sample, a sam we sample the stacks at regular time intervals. A graph of the samples is a flame graph. Um, the y-axis is always the stack trace. The x-axis is always time, but not necessarily in order. So we're gonna do this again with Vernier. So we have that slow, that slow program, but we're gonna trace it with Vernier. All we do to trace stuff with Vernier is wrap it with a dot trace and then we provide an output file name. It outputs this time profile JSON file, and that's what we view. So we use the profile viewer gem to just view the JSON file, and that starts a web server locally that we look at in our browser and we can see it. Okay, I'm gonna run it here, I've sped it up. Uh, that outputs the profile, then we run profile viewer. This starts a web server, pulls it up in your browser, and then you can go ahead and take a look, take a look at this stuff. So we'll click on stack chart, that is the flame graph for that slow program. And, okay, great job, Aaron. Now you can see that this flame graph is pretty similar to what we had done earlier in the earlier slides. Uh, Veneer supports custom markers, so we can record custom markers in our profile. For example, like if we wanted to record around each Fibonacci call, we can say, hey, this is call one, call two, et cetera. Uh, we can also, if you do that, it shows up in the profiler. You can see like each of these bars here the, each of these blue bars are runs of Fibonacci, so we can actually dive into each of those. Uh, it'll also show you here at the top each iteration. You can click on each iteration, it'll show you a profile just for that particular iteration. Uh, Vernier will show you GC information as well. So here we have a profile that has a lot of GC time. We're making GC take a long time, then manually starting the garbage collector. And you can see here in the profile output, we have a 3.6 millisecond GC pause. We also get thread information out of it. So here we're doing multiple threads. If we look in the profiler output, you can see that we have two threads here being run. And down here at the bottom, you can actually see where the threads are switching. So we can see like when a thread is running versus stalled, et cetera. Now, if we wanna use this with Rails, it's pretty simple. Uh, I like to use it with tests because the test framework has everything we need to set up fake requests and responses and stuff. So here we're hooking into active support notifications so we can say like, tell me about all the stuff that's happening inside of Rails, I wanna graph that. Then we do 10 requests and then graph it. And I'm going to do a live demo now, which I never ever do. Let's see how this works. Oh my goodness. Live demo time, please. Woo! Woo! All right, so here is, a, here is a profile. This is actually a profile of lobsters. I don't know if you've used the website. What I did for the example is I just took, I pulled down lobsters, picked one of the tests, profiled one of the endpoints. I don't really know the code base very well, but we can look at, if we look at the profile output, we can understand what the code base is doing. 
So here's our call tree, which I had talked about before. Uh, we have at the top here the main function, which has you know 2,000 some samples. Uh, we can click on marker chart, and we can understand like, okay, we we rendered a view here. We have all these views rendered, or we like let's scroll down here a little bit. Here we have active record queries, so we can see when active record queries were running. Or here we have a wrap around each request, so each request is taking about. I don't know, 140 some milliseconds. We can actually double click on a request and see what happened within that particular request. So we can see like, oh, it did, I don't know, did all this stuff, whatever. Go back to the full range. Uh, hey, stack chart, this is our flame graph. It is very hard to read because I bumped up the fonts. Uh, here's our flame, confusingly, the flame graph is not ordered by time. We call them different, different things. Uh, the one thing I really like to look at is call tree. So you can see here, oh, MySQL client. My favorite thing to do is in call tree, uh, invert the call stack. And what this does is this says all of our leaf nodes, we're going to sort by the most expensive leaf node. So if we do that, we'll see here our most expensive leaf node is, and I think you will not be surprised to see this, the most expensive one here is MySQL query because that's where we're querying the database. However, this one's interesting too. Our number two most expensive is string G sub, which is kind of weird. Uh, if we scroll down through string G sub, we'll see here eventually we're getting into application helper, avatar image. This thing actually comes from Lobsters itself. Uh, if I double click on that, it'll show us the source code. And if, I'm, if I double click again, we can see it's highlighted down here. Sorry for the big font, but we can see how it's highlighted and where those, where those things are actually coming from. Uh, so this gives us a lot of good insights into, into what's going on here. Uh, this one, boy, I don't have much time, so I don't know how I, ah, fuck it. Um, <laughs> if we look at this, if we call, go back up the call stack, you'll see that this is coming from image tag, and we have all these options here. It's taking these options and calling gsub on all the options. But if we come back up here to avatar image, you'll see all of these options are literal, like, boy, hopefully you all can see this in the back. If you can't, come get me after the talk and we'll look, poke at it together. Uh, we'll see all these options here are just um, uh, symbol literals. Since they're symbol literals, like, do we really need to be doing HTML escaping on them? Like, I'm not sure. Maybe we don't need to do G sub in this particular case. So we could possibly save time there. Anyhow, this gives you a lot of insight into your code. Back to the slides, please. Yay. Oh, th thank you. Yes. I get all this time, this time gets back on the clock, right? <laughs> it doesn't count against me. All right, so we did our live demo. I, we, talked about, we talked about writing fast apps. I wanna talk about writing apps fast now. We're gonna pivot a little bit to writing apps fast. I wanna talk about language servers. Besides artificial intelligence, I think language servers are one of the biggest innovations in our, like, in our industry today. Uh, and I want to talk about what they are. We're going to build one. If we have time, we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to build one, and then we're going to use that one we built with Rails. So language, a language server is a program, and it's just a daemon that sits on your machine and runs in the background and does stuff. And it communicates with your editor. So for example, like I use Vim. We're going to use Vim throughout this. All Yeah, Vim, come on. Yeah. <laughs> All, all five of us, we did it, yes. Uh, <laughs> so Vim, Vim is communicating with Clang D, Clang D here via language server protocol. And like, usually you don't need to start this. You don't start this daemon yourself. It runs in the background. Like the, the editor usually fires it up for you. So VS Code will fire it up for you, whatever editor you're using. Runs in the background and communicates with your editor. And your editor can communicate with many different ones at the same time. So maybe a Rust one or a Ruby one, but I mean, in reality, all you need is a Ruby one, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're all split by language type or however you want to split them. And you can have multiple per language type. And the great thing about the language server protocol is that no editor needs to know, like there's nothing specific to any particular editor. 
It's just a common protocol that all editors speak and all language server daemons speak as well. So we have this kind of thing in the middle here, our language server protocol. So if you use Vim or VS Code or how many Emacs folks we got here? Emacs? Whoa, what? Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, a couple. Wow. <laughs> jeez. <laughs> I made like a five person joke about Vim, but you know, jeez. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so it doesn't matter what editor you're using, as long as they all speak the language server protocol, they can work with any of these daemons. What's interesting about this, it's very, very similar to what we have in Rubyland with Rack. So it's, it's kind of like how Rack works. Rack is just a specification. It's how application servers communicate with web servers. And that's how, we, like, how we're able to switch out between Unicorn and Puma or whatever between any of these uh, app servers. So we're going to develop a language server real quick here. 90 slides, 24 minutes. Yes, we can do it. I like to learn by doing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to build a tiny language server. And it's going to work. And it's going to be small enough to fit on one slide. OK? Small enough to fit on one slide. And it's going to work with Vim. We're going to use Vim, because that's the editor I use. But it should work with any, any editor. Uh, this is how you configure Vim to use, a, use Clang D. But you can use this with any, like, anything you want to. Uh, it just looks for Clang D, it does LSP setup. You have to use the Vim LSP, Vim LSP plugin. This also works with NeoVim, by the way. Uh, yes, use Clang D command. This is the command that we're going to run. And then right here is saying, like, I only want you to run this when you encounter C files. So what we're going to do is we're going to write, we're going to write one, we're going to write a language server that checks for syntax. So for example, we have like bad syntax here, but it's only going to do it when we save files because we want to keep this simple and we don't have much time left. So language servers communicate typically via standard in and standard out or TCP IP. We're going to do one over TCP IP in this case. Uh, the typical order of operations is that you'll open up your Vim, your editor, uh, and then you'll open a file. And the editor will say, aha, that file is associated with some language server. I'm going to start up, I'm going to start up that language server example, Ruby LSP here. And I'm going to communicate with that language server about the file that I'm, I'm dealing with. Uh, and when you open another file, it doesn't just start a new language server. It uses the same one for that. So we have one, one instance running, and that instance is dealing with all these, all these files. Uh, the language server protocol looks like this. It's basically like, it looks very, very similar to HTTP, but a little bit different. Uh, content type is optional. Basically, it just starts with a content length. And then that's how many bytes you need to read. Uh, and when you, get these, when you get these events, they're just JSON. You can parse the JSON. And the events can come in any order that they want to. And the events typically have an ID associated with them. And that's how we keep everything in sync. So you get a message. The language server will get a message with an ID. And if it wants to respond to that particular event, it'll respond with the ID. So that's how, that's how the language server and your editor keep everything in sync. So, you just send the ID along today. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. We're just going to deal with events. So this is, our, this is our message reader, our event message reader. Reads from standard in. We're doing a little nice little trick here I like to do. We read our header into a buffer. If you give gets a string, it'll read until it finds that string. So this is a really easy way for us to slurp all the header information back out. And then all we do is we parse out what the content length is. And then we say, hey, I would like to read the JSON and the con that amount of JSON. So we parse it out and then read the JSON. Then in our writer, our writer is very simple. Our writer just like dumps to standard out. And we merge in this required key. Like part of the, part of the spec says you have to have JSON RPC 2.0 in there. Then we uh, convert that to a JSON string and then just send, calculate the length and then send that out over a standard out. And that's it. That's all we have to do. Then we have an event loop that just sits there, and it responds to, like, it sits there waiting for, waiting for stuff on standard in and then writes stuff to standard out, and we just run in a loop like that. That's all we have to do. Uh, as soon as the editor fires up your language server, it's going to send you this huge blob that looks like this. It sends an, an initialize event. This initialize event has all, like, it's telling your language server about all the capabilities that the editor can do. So uh, I don't know what any of these are, but 
this is the stuff Vim can do apparently. The important thing is it has this key here called with a method initialized and all the events that come in from language servers have this method on them. So you can map that method into the code you need to execute. So what we do in our language servers, we say like, hey, we're just gonna take the names of the events, map them to, map them to methods, then we read the JSON coming in, we look up the method and then we just call that, like dispatch to that method when it comes in. Uh, when the initialized method comes in, we need to respond so that the editor is sending the initialized method. Our language server needs to respond to that and it needs to tell the editor what, what things it wants or what things it supports. And in our case, our simple, our simple language server, we only care about when files open and close, we only care about when the files change, and we only care when the files are saved. These are the three things we really care about in this example. Uh, when a document is saved, we get an event that looks like this with a method text document did save. It's that thing right there. And then we can just map that to a method. It also tells us the name of the file that got saved so we know where to look. Uh, we just map that. First off, we set up our default response. Uh, we parse. Right here, we're going to check the syntax of the file. So we saved a file. We need to check the syntax. This isn't implemented yet. We check the syntax. If there was an error that came back, then we need to extract the line information of the error. And then we figure that we construct an error report for the editor so the editor knows where to render errors inside of the text document. And then finally, we just send that back, send that back to the editor. Uh, for checking syntax, this is very, very simple. All we do is just try to compile the file. If it blows up, then we check the, check the line number and send it back. So we just, if it blows up, we return the, return the exception. Otherwise, we return nil. Uh, and that's it. This is our language server. We did it. Oh, <laughs> thank, yes, thank you. By the way, in case you didn't notice, over the pandemic, I bought a like I bought a green screen, and I'm trying to amortize the price of the green screen, which <laughs> is where all of these photos are coming from. So here is our here is our language server, and I promised you that it would fit on one slide. And if we rotate it 90 degrees, it does <laughs> it does fit on one slide. If you scan that QR code there, you can go mess with it. But let's let's like see it in action. So here it is in Vim. Uh, if we run this, like I save the file and it re reports an error, tries to compile it, uh, save the file, fixes it, make a class, I don't know, cool, we see it break, neat. Yeah, and that's about it. it. It seems to work. It was a very, very simple language server. Now, of course, we can uh, implement other events, like we could, I don't know, Make sure that everything's formatted correctly, or run tests, or you know, do other like do other things. We don't need to just check for syntax errors. Anything you can think of that you could do with the text file, that you can just do inside the language server and report back to the editor. If you want to know more about the language server protocol, go to this go to this URL. Uh, here is a gist of that language server. So if you want to go like mess with it and try out a language server on your own, I really encourage you to do it. It's right there. Now this is Rails world. And we are Rails developers. So, like, what does this have to do with Rails? It'd be really nice to like tie this back into Rails. Now, a lot of these, like, a lot of tools uh, like to analyze your code base via static analysis, but we have kind of a problem here in Rails. Like, uh, we have a user model here. Can anybody tell me what <laughs> what attributes are on the user model? Quick. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> they, all come, they all come from the database and we have no idea. There's, it's not really telling us what, what attributes are here. Uh, another, another issue is like if we, if we have routes, like what route helpers are generated? It's kind of hard to tell what, what, route, like what helpers are generated from our routes. There are, there are some tools that help us identify this. One of the tools that uh, we've been working on at Shopify is called Tapioca. You should go check out this project. It inspects your Rails application and figures out what methods are being generated so you can feed that back into your editor and uh, get like nice keyword completion and stuff. But I've been thinking about this problem for a while and I kept thinking to myself, you know, what if Rails had a built-in language server? Like what if a language server was built into Rails? Uh, what could we do? Like what, what kind of creative things could we do? And Rails, obviously, it knows about all the metaprogramming it does so clearly, it could, it could tell a language server, like, hey, these, this is all the stuff that I did. So I put together a prototype for it. It's called Refreshing. You can go check it out here. Uh, 
I want to give a kind of a demo of the stuff I was able to accomplish with this, with this uh, language server. So we can get hover information for active record. So here's an example. Like if you hover over the user model, it tells you all of the attributes that are on the user model. Yay. Th those are the attributes. <laughs> Uh, you can do jump to definition as well. So if you hover over there and you click on schema, it'll take you. It didn't jump right here, but if you hover on it, click schema, it'll jump you to the create table. So you can take a look at that. Um, another example, we have hover information. We we're able to get hover information for URL helpers. So here's an example. Like if you hover over user URL, it'll show you the path and it'll show you the uh, path it's going to generate as well as the action that it maps to. So uh, I'm going to, this might be a little bit small for people to read, so I made a screenshot. And if we zoom in here, you can see like, if you hover over there, it shows you the path and it shows you that that maps to users show. Uh, thank you. <laughs> of course, uh, jump, to jump, to <laughs> jump to definition for URL helpers. So like we can do, if you click on that, we can go, go to definition, and it'll jump you into your routes file, too. So you can go see where that thing was, where that thing was defined. Uh, also, I was able to get automatic refreshing and error highlighting to work. I want to demo this as well. Uh, this, is, this is a huge hack <laughs> that I'm very proud of. Um, so here on the right is my editor, and on the left is the Rails server running. So I added foo here, and that doesn't exist. That's just some method. And I saved the file. And as soon as I saved the file, it refreshed the page. Like, I didn't click anything. It just refreshed it. And then uh, there was an error. And Rails communicated the error back into my editor. So I hit Save there. And you'll see when I mouse, when I hover over that, I didn't hover long enough. But when I hover over it, it shows you the error that came from the browser. What's also cool is it'll, it'll actually underline, it's probably hard to see, but it, it actually underlines the error in your, in your editor as well. Um, yes, though this probably isn't necessary because um, we're all TDDing our views, right? <laughs> we're all TDDing our views, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's, there's other things. I have other ideas for this. I think it would be really cool if we had like um, method completions for where clauses, or if we saved a file, it could run tests for us. Or maybe like in our migrations, when we're writing a migration, if we forget to add an index, it would be really nice if the editor was like, hey, you should probably add an index there. Um, now, I want to I wanna tell you like a lot of this stuff, I. <laughs> We have a team at work that's working on language servers. They're, they're working on uh, Ruby LSP. And I told them about all these ideas. And they're like, cool, we'll do that. So they did it. And it is the Ruby LSP Rails. You can go install this gem today. And it'll actually work with Rails and give you, it doesn't give you all of this functionality today, but it does give you a lot of it. Uh, I want to now, I actually want to go over how I, like, how I built this stuff, because it, it's a huge hack. And I am proud of it. So we're going we're gonna to look at how, how it works. Uh, now, in order for it to work, the app must be running. And it, must, it has to be running for you to get the, these features. And the way it works is the language server is running inside of your Rails application in development. In development. Now, when the, when the editor sends a message to the language server, like, for example, when you hover over something, uh, the editor tells the language server where it is that you're hovering, like what, you're, what line and column you're hovering over. So what you do is you just read the text of that file, or what, what you do, what I did. <laughs> read, read the text of the file, see if it looks like a constant, like a Ruby constant, and then go ahead and try to like get the constant. And if you can get the constant and it doesn't raise an exception, then check to see if the constant is uh, a child of active record base, if it inherits from active record base. If it does, then we go ahead and look up the column name and the column type, and then format, like, format all the stuff, then send that stuff back to the editor. So that's how we figure out, figure out all the column names for active record. 
Uh, the URL help for, helper information is pretty similar. Basically, like when you're hovering over something, it looks at what you're hovering over, and it's like, does that look like a URL helper? And since Rails knows about all the URL helpers, it can just ask, like, hey, are you, is, that, is that one? So it just checks the named routes, like, hey, are you a helper? Finds it, and then it gets the information and returns it back. So it just looks up the information from Rails itself. Uh, helper definitions, like jump to definition, was a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're generating all those methods, and we have to keep track of where all those methods just came from. Like, we didn't actually know where they came from before. So in order to get this, uh, I was actually extremely lucky because somebody from GitHub wanted a very, very similar feature. What they wanted is a thing where you could do uh, Rails routes-e, and it shows you where the routes are. So this is in Rails 7.1 right now. You can do bin routes-uppercase e, and it'll show you where in your routes file any particular route was defined. This is really nice if you have a very large app with tons of routes, so you can kind of see where they are. This information is exactly the same inform information I need to bubble up to the, to the editor. So it was perfect. Uh, I, just, uh, I just pinged John and was like, hey, can you guys finish up this PR? And then they did. They did all the work for me. It was great. So all we have to do in the language server is like say, hey, I want the source location for this route now. Find the source line, figure out the source column, send all that information back to the editor, and then boom, the editor knows where to go, knows where to jump. Error information was way, way harder. This actually required changes to Ruby as well as changes to Rails. So ERB, like, you, we're not going to get too into the weeds here, but ERB templates are converted into Ruby, they're compiled into Ruby code, and then they're evaluated. So the problem is, like, if an exception is raised inside of your ERB code, like, what is the backtrace? How, who is to blame for this? So we have to be able to map that backtrace back to the original template, because it doesn't make sense to jump into the generated code. So one thing that's interesting is you may have noticed in later Ruby releases where you'll get that error message that's like, you know, did you mean blah? And it'll show you some little carrots along the bottom of like, oh, you, did you mean to type that here? That information is actually associated with exceptions that get raised. So we can get that information off of exceptions, but you can't get it off of just any exception. It would only come from the very top exception. So a uh, pull request that Eileen did was to get the node ID for any particular, um, any particular, uh, I, can't remember, I can't remember what the name of the object is, ah, backtrace location. So any particular backtrace location, we want to know where did that come from in source. So Eileen added a patch for this, uh, then she updated the um, error highlight gem to take advantage of that information. And with that information, we were able to change uh, ERB, the ERB templates such that like now if you have an error like this, instead of showing, you know, post dot length doesn't exist, it'll actually underscore that he here. So we see post dot length actually has a little squiggle underneath it in ERB. And this should be in Rails 7.1 as well. Uh, the original implementation of this was done by Mame, so I want to say thank you to Mame. He implemented it inside of uh, controllers, and then we pushed it even further to happen inside of ERB files themselves. So in order to integrate this with the language server, I had to monkey patch Rails. I apologize to Eileen because she hates monkey patches so much. Uh, I had to monkey patch Rails in order to bubble this information back into the language server. So basically what happens is when, a, when an exception is encountered, this intercepts the exception and then throws the exception onto a queue. And then I have another fun hack which is basically a thread that sits there watching that queue and then popping items off the queue. And if anything gets popped off the queue, it shovels that back to the editor. Now, I know this is very complicated. And you're thinking to yourself, this is very complicated. This is some kind of Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> and my answer to you is you're absolutely right. <laughs> this is a Rube Goldberg machine. I'm surprised that any of this works, but it absolutely does. And the thing is, I think that we can actually integrate a non-hacky version of this into Rails and have this come with Rails itself. So my pitch is, uh, I want to end this presentation with some kind of pitch uh, to you, the audience, but also to the rest of the core team, is that I, like, I think we're in the middle of a, like, a revolution in terms of pro developer productivity with new, new technology that's changing the way we work, like AI and these language servers. 
And Rails has been an adopter of new technologies. And I don't, honestly, like, I don't want to adopt AI necessarily, but I do want to adopt language servers. So a weird and annoying thing about, like, ah, how many VS Code users do we have? OK, there we go. Yes, perfect. One problem, I'm sure all of you in VS Code land are using language servers. Me, I'm just getting caught up since I am a humble Vim user. When you go, different servers, different language servers have different features in them. And so when you're going into VS Code and you're like, I need a language server, you go in there and you're like, oh, there's a thousand different language servers. Now I need to process the Venn diagram in my mind of what language server provides what. I go into the VS Code store and I'm like, uh, wow, that's a lot of Rails language servers. I think it would be very nice if Rails just included a language server out of the box so we could say to everybody, like, hey, this is the one you should use. I think that this is one of those decisions that we should probably take away from developers and say, like, no, this is the one. This is the one. Use this one. So. <laughs> To conclude this presentation, I'll give you the TLDR. <laughs> the TLDR is, please, build fast apps, build apps fast, do it with Ruby and Rails, and don't forget to enable Widget. Uh, I hope you learned a lot, and I hope I didn't make you too creative. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>